Uh, welcome to Design Lab. <laughs> this is the virtual workshop series to provide Gladstone's community with uh, ongoing training and support for a wide range of design and science illustration needs. Uh, we are your hosts. My name is Giovanni Mackey, uh, the Creator Director of Communications. And I'm Tammy Tolpa, and I'm the Science Illustrator at Gladstone. Uh, Tammy, we have uh, probably the first of um, several planned PowerPoint presentations. Uh, I think we have a lot of stuff that we've talked about over the past few days to cover. Um, we might as well dive right into it. I think we've got, um, uh, we're laying down some foundation today, wouldn't you say? Yep, for sure. Okay. Lifting the hood. Yes, exactly. Peeling back the, uh, the curtain and, and letting people know what's going on with, uh, with what really is going on with PowerPoint. Why can't I wrangle it to, to meet my needs? <laughs> Very good. Well, I will, uh, I'm going to get started, share my screen. So I am going to just um, start with a brand new document. I have a document over here I'm just going to use to copy and paste some text. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and start with a totally blank PowerPoint file. Uh, I'm going to build a couple of master slides, so we're going to learn about what those are um, and how they help us. And then I'll go ahead and build a couple slides, and I'll hand it off to Giovanni, and he'll do some amazing, wonderful stuff um, with some of those slides. So, hey, Tammy. If, yeah, I forgot to do a little housekeeping. Okay. So, so let me just uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> reiterate for all you first-time <laughs> people here: this is an informal setting. This is in a meeting format. Um, all of y'all can uh, unmute and. Um, and come on camera and chime in at any time with any questions, feel free to do so. You can also pop those questions into the uh, Q&A. Um, that will be easier than the chat, although feel free to chat with each other in the chat box. Um, that is also available. Um, Q&A or questions, uh, we'll try to follow up with them on the, on the back end of this. Uh, yeah, use the Q&A so that way we can uh, more easily kind of keep track of those. Back to you, Tammy. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sounds good. I thought you were gonna say you couldn't hear me or that I moved away from my <laughs> mic or something, but let me know if that happens to you. Yeah. Okay, um, so here we are. I've got a brand new um, PowerPoint file. This is sort of like the default. Um, I don't, I'm gonna go into um, view master, slide master. And some of you maybe have been to this magical place and some of you maybe have never been here. Um, this is where we kind of set the, um, the fonts, the number of like text boxes and images on the slides. This is a great place to sort of rein in the amount of content you put on a slide, make things um, really consistent. This is where you kind of would set up a template. And so um, we're going to go ahead and make a couple master slides here. We're going to see how they impact slides that we make on the other side. So right now we're inside the master slides. Um, you'll see there's this parent slide up here and then all these little children's slides below. So here's where we, want, we would set some fonts and colors, and then it will um, be reflected in all the slides down here. And we're not gonna keep all these slides. Um, before I get into that, I'm gonna always check my page setup. And so this is the typical format for a widescreen slide presentation, which most people will do with PowerPoint. So just wanna confirm that I've got that set up. Um, then I'm gonna go here and um, I'm going to change this font. So this is the default Libri Windows font. Um, at Gladstone, we for when we're using sort of standard fonts, we use Arial or Helvetica. I'm gonna use Arial today just because I know it bugs Giovanni. Thank you. Because he's a Helvetica kind of person. <laughs> um, and so, okay, so I've got my uh, slide title is now in Arial. 44 is a good size, and then I've got this cascading list of bullets. Um, this is also in Arial. Now, what I want to do while I'm here, uh, a couple things I want to do. I'm going to go up to Arrange Selection Pane. So this is the best, your best friend if you are going to do anything advanced in PowerPoint. It's kind of like the Layers palette in Illustrator or something like Illustrator. And it shows you everything on your slide. Um, the things at the bottom are at the back of the layer stack. And then the things as you go up are closer to the top. Uh, you'll see there's these three placeholders. I could hide those if I click on this little eyeball, or I could just get rid of them. I don't, I don't actually want them, so I'm just gonna get rid of them. And so now you can see there's only two things on this master slide. There's this title and there's this um, text placeholder. 
And these are the two things that are going to inform, as I said, all the text, all the slides that come below it. So um, I'm going to do one thing. I just want to make this um, a little fancy, a little special. So I'm going to change this black to the Gladstone blue. So I, I'm sure many of you have gone in here and changed colors, right? You go to more colors. You can use these sliders to pick a color. You could also um, do what I did, which was just paste in some hex colors or type those in. And by the um, way, if you wanna if you wanna get those hex colors, uh, then those should be available uh, in the communications section of hello, uh, and uh, yeah, just cruise over to that and hello, um, Gladstone hello dot org, and uh, and go to communications team, and you'll find all those as a resource. Good call there, yeah. And so anytime I make a color here. Um, this is it right here. I can save it. As you can see, I was playing around in PowerPoint um, yesterday and today, so I've already saved some colors. But this is that Gladstone blue. So I'm going to go ahead and make both of these that color. And I don't have to go all the way back into that palette. It's going to offer up for me the recent colors I've used. So now it's hard to tell, but those are the Gladstone blue. And watch what happens over here. If I were to change this to like, you know, this like awesome red, now you see that every title slide um, that's a child of that parent slide has been changed to red. So it's this is a nice place to start. You can always go into your master slides and make changes, and then you'll see how they're updated on your other slides as well. So now I'm gonna go into these um, child slides. And um, Giovanni, I don't know, I always just pretend I'm gonna rename these to see which ones they are. I don't know if there's another way to see what their names are. Um, this is what I do. So we yeah, definitely want a title that's... slide. Yeah. That works for you. Oh yeah, totally. Uh, you find out once you're out of it, but yeah, I mean, otherwise. So we definitely want a title slide. That would be like um, the beginning slide of our presentation. Uh, we could, let's see, we could show some guides here. And I don't wanna take, I could spend way too much time aligning things. Um, and I don't wanna do that for this presentation, but what I'm going to do is, you know, make a really quick grid, right? Of, whoops, of, um. So we have a little margin around all of the edges. And I don't know. So pretend these are exact if they're not, because I would definitely make those exact. Um, but I would spend a little time doing this. And then that way I can um, align things over to the left. I like a left aligned title. I do not like a center aligned title, but that's just me. Um, uh, there are times when I will center text, probably a divider slide I might do that, but for a title I like to do it left because we read left to right. Um, so I would do the same with this thing here. Yeah, so it was um, a good, good sort of uh, practice to be consistent with your alignment, your text alignment. So if you're aligning right on most things, uh, especially on the same pages, but consistency across uh, an entire deck. Um, yeah. Is, oh, yeah. Is standard. And you'll notice that this is bottom aligned. So that means if as that title gets longer, it'll head north instead of heading south. That's what we want. And then I like my prompts to be meaningful. So I'm just gonna say click to add title. And then that's what's gonna show up when I build my slides. And then I want this to say click to add names, name, because uh, our title slide usually will have a name. Um, and then, whoops, I might, uh, I could duplicate this or remember we're on our masters we're not even making slides yet so we're adding placeholders i'll insert another text placeholder. Um, i'll get rid of all this stuff and i'll say click to. Add. Affiliations and then if I don't get rid of this bullet it will that will always be a bullet which we don't want that to be here and then i'm going to make this smaller. Maybe we'll make this bold. Um, I can I can format the paragraphing of this. So if I go into here, uh, I'm just going to add some spacing so that if this has more than one line, uh, maybe that's too much. We'll see how that works when we play with it. Um, but you can adjust the paragraph spacing even on your on your regular slides too. But you can definitely do that on the master slides. So I might pull these to be you know like that, um, knowing that I can edit them later. And then the last thing I want to do is I want to add. Um, a box for I, so that I can put a big, beautiful image behind my title slide so that I start my presentation really bold, got a beautiful image, maybe it's microscopy, 
Maybe it's some um, cool looking data science stuff. So I'm going to go here and um, I'm not, you're going to, I'm not going to add, add a picture placeholder and you're going to say, Tammy, why aren't you adding a picture placeholder? And I'll tell Tammy, you why. Why aren't you adding a picture placeholder? Thank you. <laughs> so I played around with this. I'm adding this content placeholder and I hate the way it looks because it's got all, it's, it's something that can hold text or images or icons or little movie or data or whatever. But if you only add that picture placeholder, I don't know if you know this, Giovanni, you can only add a picture from your computer. Okay. If you want to add an online picture, you have to have this placeholder. Did you know that? I did not know that. I just figured it out. So I'm going to make this say click to add picture spelled right. What a random nuance, but par for the course for I know, PowerPoint. I know. I learned it the hard way. <laughs> So now if we look at our selection pane, we've got our title, we've got this subtitle, which is really our name, we've got this placeholder for our affiliations, and then we've got this placeholder for that big, beautiful image. And so I'm going to drag that all the way to the bottom because I want that behind all of our text. Um, and then a couple more things I could do, I could select, oops, I'm going to hide that because it's in my way. I'm going to select these three uh, and I could go arrange distribute vertically so there's equal space between them once yes, you get text ready. once you get text in here it might there might be too much space and you can just come back to your master slide and nudge that around um but for right now i'm gonna say that that's good um i'm gonna assume that that beautiful picture is going to be dark so the last thing i'm gonna do before i leave is i'm going to make the text here white and it's going to look like it's gone, but it's not. It's just ready for this beautiful image to be placed behind it. So now I've got my title slide. That's great. Um, now I'm going to just build a couple more slides. I'm going to get rid of these placeholders again. We definitely want a slide that has our title and one block of content. That's what this is. Uh, and it looks like I don't have my nice grid anymore. Oh, boy. No, are my guides just here? Oh, no, they are. Well, mysteriously. Um, okay, well, so here is my template for title and one block of content. So I'm just going to say click to add title, leave the rest there. Um, we've got a slide for like a divider. So when you're in your presentation, you're going to a new section. That's a good one to have. I'm going to build that. I don't need this. I just want to have one block of text. I probably want this in the middle. I would want this sort of aligned in the middle. I'm going to add my, uh, my placeholder again. Because I think it's going to be nice to have a big, beautiful image behind that. Click that picture. And then remember, I'm going to make this, oh, I'm going to say add title, and then I'm going to make this white. Okay. Um, it's going to be good to have a title slide with two boxes. So I'm going to do that. Get rid of those placeholders. Now this one is of no use to me. I'm just going to get rid of that. I don't know why we'd ever want only a title. Uh, a blank slide's good to have. We'll keep that one. No, no. Who would use this? Nobody. Nobody's. I've never seen anybody ever use that. No. So we don't. We'll just clean it up. All maybe right, if so, you have a kiosk mode. I don't know. This or is like so, a bookmark. So a bookmark, maybe. Um, okay, so we've got, let's see, we've got our title slide, we've got our main slide, it's got a title, one block, a divider slide, a title with two blocks of content, a blank slide. Maybe let's just make one more divider slide. So we could duplicate this and we can make something that just has like half the slide is a picture, maybe half the slide is text. And then we can, it's nice to rename these for yourself. So let's call this divider slide. Oh, oh, oh. Divider slides 
Alt. And then this will be other side. And you can obviously name this whatever works for you. You know, I would, I think it's worth saying that like you're kind of cruising through this and you're you obviously have some intention in mind as you're building this out and like you're having consistency. I, I'm sure a lot of people are not going to necessarily be approaching this and thinking like, oh, I've got a design already hashed out in my head. I know exactly how to execute that, which I think is, uh, you know, I think to, to sort of, um, I don't know, re reveal a little truth here is that you, you did think about this a bit more and We've actually started building out one of these templates to to be able to share to the, the larger community. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. it, this does it, what this does demonstrate is that you can kind of enter in and and start to customize. You don't have to be locked into what those masters are. You can fully customize those to meet your needs, and and really you should go in to edit those because they will pay dividends on the back end. Yeah, for sure, and you'll. Once you set it up for yourself, then you'll see how easy it is to sort of create a really consistent presentation. In fact, uh, like, you know, the other, this sort of other approach to this and is, is really that you can do most of your designing, not in the master, but uh, actually, you know, all your, all your local modifying that you would do in the actual page. Um, but it's always a great thing to then go back in and and update those masters to match that style, that restyling that you did. Mm -hmm. um, but those mm -hmm. fundamental ones like the uh, title and single box of content or the two content box ones and a blank one, going in and just like immediately customizing those ones because you know you're going to use those ones. The title and the yep. subtitle one and those the nuances of the design on that. Um, I know you, someone like yourself or, or, or myself, we're going to have more intention going into that, but I think, um, people who aren't design oriented may not, but that's where you can go back in and, and refine that later too. Oh yeah. It's, it's going to evolve, right? It's not yeah. just, you don't make it once and then that's it. You can yeah. play with it. I mean, I, you, you just made that look real easy. Um, but, <laughs> but I also know that you put some thought into it. So I'm just going to throw yeah. that out there. Yeah. Uh, so now we've got, we still have no slides. We've just, all we've done is lifted the hood, created some templates for us to use. Now we'll make a couple slides. So um, if I go here to new slide, if I didn't choose which slide, it's just gonna feed me the title slide because that's usually the first slide of your presentation. Uh, let me hide those guides for a second. And let me get my selection pane, which is like my best buddy of all time. So, now I'm going to add an image. Um, I'm going to hide these elements because they're in front of this big picture placeholder and they're just going to be in my way. So there's, I got a couple options here, right? I could add an image from online. I could add an image from my computer. Let me just show you what this looks like if you pick online. Um, I think it's pulling images from the web through Bing. So let's say we wanted um, birds. And you'll see if you don't have this checked, it might be providing you images that are not free for you to use. So if you do go this route, which I know people are pulling images off the web, I would uh, use this to your advantage because it's built into here. There's still a disclaimer that you're responsible for knowing the copyright you know, limitations. Um, so just know that. But this is a feature that I wasn't aware of until recently um, that you can sort of use Bing built into Microsoft, right? To like find online images. For our sake, okay. we're gonna, oh, go ahead. Well, I was going to say that, you know, I think a lot of people, especially in uh, academic environments, just sort of pull freely from the web. Mm -hmm. And um, so I just want to have a little bit of that conversation yeah. about, you know, how that if it is for a purely didactic presentation and use an academic setting, you know, there there really are no copyright restrictions for using some things. But what I do also think and what I oftentimes promote is that. Uh, give attribution when you can, because these, this is intellectual property, you know, people did take these photos, it's not, you know, these are not everything is sort of free for the taking. Um, and also the longevity of um, most of these projects, you know, you never know when you're going to use it in what setting and, um, you know, much like the templates aspect of it, you put a little bit of work in now, capture some of that, you cover yourself for the future, and you know that you're doing, um, doing right by you know, the, the community that's kind of created this. It's not like just, you know, corporate corporate overlords who are like creating this. Like these are actually individuals that are that are um that are creating some of this um yeah. stuff that we can share and use. 
highly trained individuals too. And right? Creative Commons, ever since that, you know, that that really did uh, allow for a lot of share and share alike and reuse and um, put some specific mm -hmm. things, you know, terms around it, which is, you know, mostly attribution. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thanks so for it's adding a great, that. It's a great feature that PowerPoint has in here and um, one that Tammy only revealed to me recently. It only revealed itself to me recently. Uh, so, but let's show how to use our own images. So this little one with the monitor, that's an image from your computer. So I'm going to grab some beautiful microscopy. And then if I turn my other elements on, you can see where this is headed, right? This is going to be a gorgeous title slide with some beautiful imagery behind it. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and copy some of my text. If you do copy from a Word file or from um, a Google Doc or another slide, your best bet is to select your text box and do paste and match formatting. That way you're not going to pull the formatting from Word, which might be 12 point something. You know what I mean? You want to keep the formatting in your template. But you can also type directly into here. So I'm just going to put my name, even though this is not my project at all. Thank you, Alan, for letting me use your words. Um, and then I'm going to paste in here again. Paste and match formatting. Or I can do that. Um, keyboard shortcut. And then you can see there's some returns here. I can just clean this up a little bit. Uh, and then, you know, I might, I might play around here a little bit. That seems a little, like a lot of, a little too much space in there. I could play around there. You know, I could, I could decide this should be larger, right? Maybe that should be 28. And I can go make that change on my master slide. Now it's going to be hard to see because it's white, whoops. But uh, let's make that 28. And then if I go back to slide land, you can see that that got bigger. So you could play, you know, you might find that once you populate these placeholders, they're just spread out a little too more, too far, or they're closer than you want them to be. Um, sometimes you just don't know that when you're just placing them um, on your master until you get into actually adding content then you might want to change how things look. Yeah, and that content, that content will be linked to the master and styled according to the master until you actually modify it locally. Then it starts to override. But if you ever hit that reset button um, that's up there, yeah, exactly. Um, then it's gonna, unless you go back to the master and kind of update those with your modifications, then it's always going to, um, you know, you're always gonna get reset back to that that yeah. less than ideal one. So it is a great practice to go back into your master and modify those as you sort of refine this. Yeah, so like I changed the spacing here on my slide, not on my master, right? So when I did that reset up here, it went back to the original. So if I did like this, I could go into my master, adjust it there, and then it'll be that way next time I make a slide like this. Um, another nice thing I think to have on your title slide, it would be um, the logo, or maybe there's even a couple logos. Now I know you're going to say, Tammy, why don't you put that on the master slide? Then it will always be there. That might be. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Tammy, why didn't you put that on the master slide? So, right, you should. We could put that on a master slide. But the, the thing I've discovered the hard way is that if you have anything editable, like this placeholder, or rather anything that's not editable on your master slide is in the back. So if, because we want this to be editable, we want to be able to change the picture, even change the cropping, it covers this up. So at this point, I don't think there's a way to have this on the master slide unless this becomes a static image that's not changeable. Yeah. And you're not using, it's not like you have multiple title slides anyway in a presentation. So it's, it's not going to really benefit you for that like batch processing. A good thing to have. And as long as I mentioned that, why don't we show that you could crop this image back here. So I could just decide I only want, you know, this part with the magenta. Um, normally, I don't like to scale up on slides, but for things that are in the background, it's okay if they get a little soft. It's not, it's not, um, it's there for decoration. It's not there to sort of convey um, a specific scientific concept. So um, in that case, I would have no problem scaling up. And so that is one of the nice things about having this placeholder there is that we can we can zoom in, we can zoom out, we can shift side to side. I just did right click and then crop. 
you know, once I scaled it up, I could move it around, you know, it might, you might want just like that, you know, so you can play around with that too. Yeah. That's a beautiful and definitely, title slide. Definitely a technique that we will explore in further episodes where, um, where we can actually leverage that to um, create um, some more dynamic slide presentations too. So more to come on that. All right. Um, now I'm going to make just a couple more slides. So I've noticed too, if I just click new slide, it's always, it's not going to give me another title slide, right? Because you only have one of those. So it's already going to go to sort of that second slide in my little series here. So here's where I can just create um, a regular, regular slide. Um, so really quickly, I could um, go and type, I could just start typing in here. Um, I'm just going to copy from my source deck here. I'm going to do paste and match formatting. Uh, the Gladstone style, I think, is title case, where each word is capitalized, okay. except for these little words. So um, depending on where you're grabbing, if you are copying and pasting, just know that you can make some changes up here. Sentence case is when only the first word is capitalized. Um, the others are obvious. Toggle case, I don't know why you'd ever use that. But yeah, they call um, it capitalize each word, but it's actually um, the the design term or the standard term would be um, title case. Title case, yeah. Yeah, but the, and there's a great resource for this actually, which is several websites that do this. But capitalize my title is uh, one of my favorite go tos. Um, if you just go to that and you punch in your title there, um, there is uh, several different style guides you can. Uh, but uh, Chicago is a great one that will give you a good clean standard of um, what letters um, AP style will. Uh, it just sort of blanketly does a lot of the small two-letter words or whatever, but that's not necessarily grammatically correct. And I've worked at places where if it is a if it is yeah. a sentence or a question, they will use sentence case. They won't capitalize every word if it's a question. Yeah, and and or, Alex or made a, a comment. Sentence. Alex made a comment to say that um, is should actually be properly capitalized, <gasps> and that 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 goes to exactly what I was saying yeah. about capitalize my. I don't Thank know. you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, very good. So now I think I can change the layout. Couldn't I? Couldn't I switch this to? There you go. So even once I started, I could switch the layout of my slide to a different one. So let's go ahead and real quickly. Um, I don't I want to add something that's mine. So I'll insert this here uh, and then I'm going to add some text here. Oh, I didn't. I didn't keep the formatting. So I'm going to go ahead and have to switch that manually. Uh, let's see the sizing of this thing. So okay, so that I can scale that up a little bit more. So I'm just going to bring this here. And then as we know, I can pull it to the back. So now it's behind this title if I want a little overlap. Uh, and then really quickly, I'm just going to show something I would do for a really simple slide um, to create a little hierarchy. I might just bold the top line. And then I might go ahead and pull some colors from my illustration. I might grab that red. I could save that if I wanted. I'm just trying to link this text with some of this anatomy. I'll do the same thing here. I will grab a purple. Now my eye tells me that's not that is not dark enough. There's not enough contrast between that and my white background. So I could play with these sliders. Get kind of a darker purple here if I wanted. I could save that. Um, and so that's just a little a quick way to sort of make a really easy to understand slide. I would say uh, my general approach would be more slides with less on them, I think it's preferable to fewer slides that are just crammed full of content. You can click through slides um, quickly uh, and still have sort of meaningful and easy to grasp concepts on them without filling your slide. Because if you fill your slide, especially with text, people are going to read that instead of listen to what you're saying. And um, the primary delivery for slides is in person, or at least with a person accompanying the tech, the, the slide presentation. So. I would encourage everyone to err on the side of less is more on their slides. If you do want to hand off a deck, you can put a lot of content in the notes and then keep your slides really clean and easy to understand. 
Anything you want to add to that, Giovanni? Yeah, did a, did a good job. Cool. All right. Well, I'll make one more slide and then I'll hand this off. So I'm going to do my keyboard shortcut. I'm going to capitalize each word, but maybe not this one. Oh, it's a fun game. <laughs> I will um, add some bullets here. And then I'm going to add an image of mine. I think your own images should be first, but that's just mine. And then if I go to check the size of this, so this I want bigger. I'm going to scale it up. It's not the best idea because if I zoom in, you know, I can see that it's gotten pretty soft. I think that's okay for something like a gel. Those are soft already. Um, but what I probably would want to do would be maybe crop this out and then add some text annotations that will be really crisp on top of that. Um, but that is the kind of tips and tricks that we're gonna show in our next PowerPoint Design Lab. So for now, I'm gonna leave this here, but I know that I can improve upon that on my PowerPoint slide um, if I choose to, so that it will look really crisp and clean when it's um, projected or given as a presentation. So with that, um, I think I'm going to hand this over to Giovanni, who's going to build a couple really cool images and then add them to our slide deck, unless there's any questions at this point. Uh, this was awesome, Tammy. Just uh, real quick, uh, slowly, how did you get the selection pane and how do you go back and <laughs> forth to master? Yeah, slowly, I will do that, no problem. So the selection pane, are you, so, it might be a little different on Windows machine, but it's at the home tab or ribbon arrange selection pane. Right. And it'll show up over here um, and it's it's your new best friend like starting today. You're going to love this thing. Yeah, um, I was I was more than familiar with the animation pane and with the um, the object right. style pane, I think so. But uh, the selection pane is also relatively new to me, even though I've been using PowerPoint a very long time and it is a serious game changer, which is essentially, it's it's the equivalent of a layers palette. In it is. Illustrator or Photoshop, yeah. And I cool. only learned about it learning about um, how to set PowerPoint files up for accessibility so that screen readers can read PowerPoint files. And the, um, the selection pane dictates the read order. And so that's the only context that I even learned about it. I never learned about it for a slide design. It was this accessibility task that brought it to my attention, but super helpful. And then to switch between slide land and master slide land, you just go up to um, view master slide master. And then now this takes us in here. We know we're here um, because I can close the master and also it kind of says slide master over here. Yeah, a new ribbon element, element comes in, that slide master ribbon. And so you could close or you could, um, you could go to home, I think. No? No, uh, you got to close that thing. <laughs> you got to hit the close. <laughs> View normal. That's what it was. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And, and it can be confusing when you're new. Like, am I on my slides? Am I on my master slides? Um, mm -hmm. And so just the more time you dip into those two worlds, the more comfortable you'll be. You know, Terrific. one of the... Oh, and sorry. you mentioned you were going to share maybe one or two templates at some point. Okay, great. Yeah, Excellent. we're building. Yeah, we're going to build some um, investigator templates. Yeah, we're uh, we're um, Tammy being here is such a great help because uh, we we got the bandwidth to be able to uh, produce some of these things we've been wanting to do a long time. Not only that, but she's bringing a tremendous amount of expertise so we can actually build these really robust templates out. And so look for those. Um, those are coming soon for both for the scientific crowd, but also for the operations group, um, some more business forward ones. So that might be helpful. So yeah, that's good. I'm excited about those. Maybe and, one thing I'll show. Yeah. Oh, before, because I realized the thing I asked you to remind me not to forget, I we both forgot. Yeah. <laughs> but when you see this happen on your PowerPoint slide, um, it's because maybe you know, but if you um, format object, if you go over here under text box, 
I meant to check this on all of the text boxes or text placeholders in my master slides, and then that won't happen. Um, and that's another way to just keep the text size consistent and true to what you've said on your master slides. If you allow that, um, does it shrink or resize? It's going to make things really small. It's going to be harder to read. They're also going to be inconsistent. And again, we want that consistency. We want that consistency in some places, right? The same, you know, titles on every slide or most slides, the same font sizes. We want that consistency. And then the contrast, which Giovanni will get into as well, is sort of, you know, between maybe your dark slides for your title or divider slides and then your lighter slides for your content. And that flipping back and forth keeps your audience engaged too. They too much consistency it makes it harder for people to stay engaged in a presentation. So if you sort of do a flip flop, um, it keeps people watching. Yeah, it triggers that change, the significance of that, you know, we're shifting gears. Yeah, so with that, we'll shift gears. Yeah, let's do that. Let's <laughs> um, see here. So um, I think, uh, you know, what Tammy touched on about, you know, selecting an image for your, um, for your title slide, uh, it's always an important kind of decision to make. It's sort of the first thing people see. Uh, I've seen a huge variety of these and all different sort of standards of quality. Um, but what I think is um, a, a sort of great go-to is to you know select some some microscopy, excuse me, microscopy, some data science, anything that is data visualization, something that's kind of relating back to the science that you're talking to, and that's a great sort of tie-in, visual tie-in. Um, so how do you, once you find that thing, how do you um, then craft it or curate it so that way it kind of feels a little bit more uh, in sync with uh, your organization or your, um, uh, you know, maybe your lab or, you know, whatever kind of style that um, that's kind of bringing in, bring it uh, more in alignment with the rest of your presentation. So Tammy was building out our, our Gladstone um, colors. And so I'm going to demo how to select some microscopy and, and stylize it in a very Gladstone way. So um, I think, you know, without, we could pull from a, a, a deep bench of great microscopy that we um, created here at Gladstone. But um, I also just wanted to show that uh, maybe your lab isn't creating so much of that, but, um, but there are actually great resources for this and open and freely use, uh, usable by the public. Uh, if you go to the NIH, you can go to their images and B-roll. And I just uh, actually did a quick search for um, uh, the uh, NIH images um, and the, um, uh, I think I searched public domain or something like that. And I, and I found this really quickly. I just put, I just threw that um, link into the uh, chat as well. Um, so uh, in order to look through these, uh, I can just go to their Flickr site. They tell me I'm leaving this and they kick me over to Flickr. And here I can kind of take a look at all the sort of things that they have on offer. I have to move some uh, very intrusive windows from Zoom. Okay, now I can see. Um, so as you can see here, I've just got like um, a ton of categories that I can look through. And I think, I think I went into this NIH funded and um, some great kind of high contrast ones. These are very large. Wow, those are great. Right? Yeah. I mean, not just great, but um, uh, but actually already curated and kind of ready to go. Um, the one that I wanted. Ah, here we go. Okay, so I found this one. And I thought it was particularly great. It's got a good amount of resolution. Um, it's also keyed in some classic uh, fluorescence. You know, it's the red and the blue, and that is going to come into play really uh, importantly in a second. So, um, I uh, but for all intents and purposes, this one I, I like, um, and um, it's also a little bit challenging, right? Because it's very high contrast and a lot of black, and it's also kind of square. So I thought this kind of was a nice to select from. So from this downloads area, you know, there's no signing in and, or um, agreeing to anything. It's all just open access. So it's great. And I am going to grab the original and um, go ahead and open that up in Photoshop. Now, one quick word. 
I am in Photoshop beta. I don't know if you can see down here, but I am part of a beta release. And I want to show you a couple of features today that actually that it will soon be available in the standard Photoshop, but I think are super handy. Um, and um, in addition to that, then um, this, the rest of the stylizing things are going to be um, uh, in a standard form. So uh, if you're not part of that beta, um, then uh, this is still going to apply to you quite a bit. But uh, what is available in beta is uh, generative AI. Now, you kids might have heard a little bit about this recently. It's really <laughs> sweeping the nation, um, but it's actually extremely powerful. Photoshop has always had um, a lot of um, tools available for um, uh, like sort of inferring um, uh, information and, and sort of populating it. And that's generally been under um, content aware fill. Uh, but now uh, the generative uh, fill is really making that obsolete. And it's, um, it's extremely impressive about how it can actually generate some content. So the, the first problem with this is that I want to actually like this cluster ball here, uh, this uh, um, cluster of cells. Um, and I want to keep that as like a focal point. Um, but I don't want that to overlay or come under the text. So I kind of want to offset that. And I can actually make that happen here. Um, you could also use that uh, content aware fill, and it would probably do a fairly good job of probably putting in a few cells. But um, I'm going to show you here how um, generative fill is actually going to do an extremely impressive job of that. So I'm going to go ahead and expand this. I already have my artboard set to 169, which is the same ratio that I know that my um, that my PowerPoint is at. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go ahead and hold down Command click on the layers palette where my uh, where my image is on, and that is going to select my image immediately. And I'm going to invert that selection. If you go up to select and invert, um, uh, you can get already get that. And then I'm going to go up to select again and actually um, under modify, I'm going to expand that a little bit just because I want it to creep a little bit. I don't want to get a little, any artifacts of just, you know, the, the fill hitting the edge. And then there's like a, say, half a pixel. So I'm just going to get a little bit, creep in a little bit into that image. So I'm going to expand it by 10 and, oh, no, that rounded. Sorry, let's try that again. Modify, expand, not smooth. And I'm going to say 10, and it's going to creep in. And then at that point, now um, this, uh, they also introduced this like, uh, like so, um, context menu, um, which is right here. So it's handily right here. I can hit generate fill. And then uh, I'm going to hit generate. And see what happens. So it pushes up to the cloud and it's thinking about it, coming up with ideas and randomly generating something. That should be done in a second. Stop filling air. Okay, so it gave me a few good examples. So it gives me three options here. And I'm just gonna look through here and say, okay, some of these are pretty wild. Um, wow. and but they are actually all filling the space. And you know what? If uh, I'm a lay person, uh, I didn't know, I don't know if you knew that, Tammy. <laughs> but I don't, I wouldn't be able to tell the difference if this is actual microscopy or not. Like there's some little hallmarkers, but as much as I've looked at it, I don't. And I would probably argue that most scientists probably wouldn't. Do it. And this is really critical. We are only using this for a decorative element. Yeah. It is not for scientific purposes. And we are not actually trying to report anything. In fact, we're stylizing this and we're going to get more into the colors and all of that later. So it, this is kind of going further with we're just using this to sort of evoke, you know, I, I like to think of it more as an illustration. It's something that's kind of like uh, a little editorializing what that title slide really is. And it's kind of giving you some eye candy to look at that will kind of, that will reinforce that, that title. Um, so, you know what, this, this looks pretty good. Um, but, um, but the, um, the problem at this point is that um, the way that I want to modify it really is that I want to isolate um, the individual channels here. So um, because these are captured with these fluorescents, red and blue, um, that also coincides with the channels of light, red, blue, green. And that means that I can actually isolate those, those um, objects themselves. So if I look here, I can look in the red channel and this original content here, it looks actually really great. It's got a lot of detail and everything. Now, when it tried to interpret it, uh, it did a pretty terrible job. I couldn't tell of that, you know, from the image it generated. It looked pretty good and it looked convincing. But actually, when I look into the channels, it looks awful. So um, let's see, I've got 15 minutes here. Yeah, let's go for it. Let's dive into it. I'm going to, um, 
I'm going to show you how <laughs> I'm going to show you instead um, how to get a better um, get better results here. So I'm going to first go back into these channels and I'm going to separate these out and I'm um, I'm going to select uh, this whole object here. So like that whole guy here, I'm going to copy um, just the red channel. So again, I'm in the channels window. I'm, I'm selecting all. Um, I'm clicking only on the red and therefore isolating it. I'm going to copy it. I'm going to go back to my layers. I'm going to do a lot of jumping around. So I'm going to create a new layer that's right on top of the old one. And I'm going to paste in there. And you can see here that I got, I pasted exactly my, um, uh, exactly just that channel information. And it's in black and white still. So, uh, and I'll hold that and I will um, turn that layer off. So that way I'm only looking at the background image again, go back in here, isolate that blue layer and therefore I've got isolated just those cells and, um, or that, that fluorescent. And then I'm gonna select all, I'm gonna copy and I'm gonna jump back over the RGB, um, add that layer and paste it again. Um, now uh, I could have pasted, paste, uh, in place, which would have put it right there, but I'm just going to go ahead and move that back over here. Group tool, yeah, put it right there. So um, now uh, go ahead and hide the original one. I'm just looking at this and um, I'm selected on that. I'm going to again go in here, select just that object. I am again going to invert that selection and modify expand. And I am going to do that same generative fill. Think about it and produce three options for me. And by the way, you can, can like, um, if you're not very happy with the results that it gave, um, you can, it's still Photoshop. So you can combine those, you know, you still have the power to go in and kind of fade in between them um, and use all the functionality that Photoshop is famous for. Um, or you could just say, give me three more or three more, or three more, you can do that sort of infinite. Each one of these will be unique and completely random. Um, so you can see here, it's generating some kind of crazy stuff. Um, I don't like any of them, so I'm just gonna tell it to do it again. So you're just performing that on like the red channel, right? Yes, exactly. But it's no longer the channel, now it's an actual layer and it's just a black and white image that is a part of that layer. So you can see here that now I don't have three anymore, I have six options. And okay, well, this is kind of interesting. I don't think it's realistic, uh, but it's kind of interesting. And let's just go with it because I can't do it, keep doing this forever. Um, so cool, I got that result and I'm gonna like go ahead and I'm gonna, um, I'm just gonna combine that with the other one. I'm gonna call that just flat and move on with my life. So I'm gonna hit command E or control E, which is gonna flatten that artwork down on those two stacks or, or it's actually, um, uh, where am I here? Uh, it's going to be merge, uh, merge layers. Or control E on our PC. So um, uh, now I'm going to do the same thing, but I'm going to do it on the second one, on the second layer, which is the other fluorescent, the blue fluorescent. Uh, again, select it, invert it, I expand. So it's less. While it's doing that, um, I'm also going to point out that I've pulled up um, those Gladstone colors that we talked about before. I've kind of pulled those into my swatch library. So you can see them up here. Um, I also, uh, and now that, and, and the fact that I preload them up here means that I can go ahead and grab those. And I'm going to go ahead and preload some of those in here. And if I drag that swatch down into here, it uh, automatically wants to um, uh, uh, clip it to a layer that's below it, um, but I can just hit uh, option click on that and it declip it from that. And I'll just sort of stand alone. Another option you can do is actually just create a blank layer and then just drop that in there and uh, you'll get the same. Um, basically it's a flat color and that's what I just want. I just want a flat color. And I'm gonna use this function in here that actually is part of the, um, the clipping mask of that flat layer. And what I'm going to do is I am going to um, 
first, uh, before I look at the results of my generative fill that I was just waiting on, I'm going to go ahead and option click, which isolates my generative fill layer that I, uh, that I was happy with. I'm going to select all, I'm going to copy it, and I'm going to go back to my magenta layer, and I'm going to option click into my, uh, into my, into my mask. And uh, once I'm in there, uh, paste that image that I had. And I can start to see the results of that. I'm going to take this dark blue and I drop that into another layer as well because I want that as my background image. And I drop it below and you can see what's happening right now. I'm getting a stylized graphic version of that and it's already getting in some muted colors that I can definitely put behind there. I guess still a little bit of ways to go on that, but I'm pretty happy with that so far. It's already starting to look good. Now, back to my results that I um, was looking at before. All right, this is kind of crazy, but I kind of love it. I'm going to merge those two again. I'm going to select those guys, copy them. And now this time I'm going to go into my magenta flat. And I will option click into that clipping mask and paste it in there. Okay, so now when I reveal uh, my layout here, let's see um, how they combine. Basically mimicking the exact way that those fluorescent uh, or those light microscopy images were captured uh, in black and white and then assigned a color. And, uh, but I'm, I'm just reassigning those colors to sort of Gladstone colors. Wow. Yeah. So. Now this has a lot of contrast and it's got a high, you know, it's, it's very bright. That's too much for me and I am, um, but you can actually knock it down. And there's tons of ways that I can go about doing this. Um, but I would say that um, uh, my favorite way is actually to use uh, some camera raw features. I think they probably will skip that because that is, um, there's so many functions in that, but it is extremely powerful. But at this point, I think um, I, I'm pretty happy with this. Um, uh, yeah, let's, let's go ahead and say, call this good. And, um, let's bring it into PowerPoint yeah. now where we can, um, do a little bit more to make it more legible once we get, uh, can we see it, uh, against the original uh, back and forth? This is amazing. Uh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. It definitely um, looks a little bit like a tardigrade to me before you added that, um, acid blue component. It was giving me tardigrade vibes. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so there was the original, and then here's it after. Original, after. Very cool. Okay, yeah. So, um, you know, I could export these, but I'm really lazy, and um, like to do instead. Oh, you know what? Got all these things you can't see. After, but um, I tend to be a bit lazy about this sort of thing, and I just like let me grab a screenshot. So I'm just going to grab this screenshot. I know exactly where that's going to go. And this way I can just kind of work quick and dirty. Uh, oh, oh, not the PowerPoint I wanted. Let's see what happens. Great, had I teed that up. The one I was just, the demo deck is the one I was just uh, thank building, you. yeah. Yeah, okay, right on. So, um, so yeah, so Tammy, this is a great, you know, version here, but actually I'm just going to go ahead and delete that. Um, <laughs> All right. uh, and um, yeah, what, what goes on if I want to add my own, uh, did I lose my other stuff? Oops. You got to go to the selection pane. I know, I know, but I was just okay. worried. Oh, okay. Oh yeah. I was worried that I missed it. You know what? Look at, I can actually select on these. Right? See if you can get, grab it then. Okay. Is that from my computer? Uh, you're right. Oh, wait, no, I'm getting spinning wheel. Depending on where those other boxes are, I was able to like, sometimes I could get it. Yeah. It was driving me bonkers. Right, though, I should have done. What does the spinning wheel mean? What did I do? I have to take evasive action. Oh, oh, it happens. It happens. Yep. Okay. 
Well, if you're going to paste the screenshot, right? You probably don't even yeah. need that well, placeholder. Yeah, no. Well, yeah, exactly. Good idea. All right, let's just delete it. Actually, let's just. Yeah. Okay. I'm just going to drag this puppy bin. Okay. So um, this one I know, which is at uh, a better resolution than that. Yeah, just throw that in there. And then uh, if I only had that selection pane open. See it right there, right? The line? Nope. Two, there. So right there in front of me. Yes. Okay. Okay. And drag that at the bottom. So now this isn't quite working, right? This is like not actually look at the alignment is kind of weird too. Let's make sure we're aligned here. And also let's make sure that the size is correct. So if I double click on this, then I also get the format picture. Uh, if I can look at the size, I'm right here uh, 7.5 by 13 PPM. Good enough. What is that? Is that right? Help me out here, Tammy. Do you remember what it is? Yeah, it should be 13333. Three, three. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it'll just bleed off. It'll never show, right? When you do, you yeah. know, do your slideshow. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, how do I make this a little bit more vis um, legible back there? Well, you know, a standard thing, and I think a lot of people are used to this, is just create a box in front of it um, to help um, uh, to, to maybe put a, a dark box below. Um, but we're going to be a little bit more nuanced than that. We're going to just kind of feather that a little bit and use um, our gradients fills. Mm -hmm. um, so let's go ahead in here. And uh, we don't need four. We just need two. We want to go from uh, actually just use the same color. So I'm going to use the same Glassstone blue um, hex code 002A40. Uh, and I'm going to apply this actually across the board, but I'm going to play with transparency. So right here, I'm selected on this toggle and I'm going to, I'm going to drop that transparency down to zero on the first one. I'm just going to knock that back to about, you know, maybe 10%. And then um, I'm going to change the direction of that. So I'm going to select here from these um, standard here and now it's coming in from the left and um, cutting under my typography. And I could slide this one over and I can play with the opacity of that. Um, so that way, maybe that's more like 30%, um, you know, and um, position it right there. And then once I get it in, once I know that that's going to be legible, um, I should have sent this back below the typography and immediately you can see it sort of. Have you ever played with that angle spot in the gradient? Um, I have. Okay. Yeah. 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 It, you can just get it um, to kind of move around a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You can you can watch it kind of spin around. Um, yeah. And another option than this is doing a radial gradient because this is sort of a round object and you're kind of surrounding it too. Um, but yeah, it's a, the the handles and the way you manipulate that is um, is not quite as easy as a Illustrator or Photoshop. And we are getting tight on time, actually. This is um, we that looks great. This stuff, yeah. Um, we didn't quite get to adding this to um, you know alternate layouts like your um, subdivider um, layout, but I think uh, you can kind of infer from here. You would, you know, when I when I'm putting on that, you're you're not going to have any. You wouldn't need type underneath it, um, so uh, you could probably have that, you know, as a full image. Um, uh, and you could just simply insert it and do a crop into that location. Um, but otherwise that's, um, that's a great way to like continue having an image like this kind of, uh, consistently run across the th uh, thematically across your, your slides. Yeah. You could repeat that for like your section dividers or other elements or in your thank you slide or something. And yeah, that would be a nice exactly. way, right, to make it really well designed, cohesive presentation. Yeah. And yeah. and unique, like yeah. Super, it, super it, unique. Yeah, exactly. You're not gonna see that sort of thing. And it's um and it's gonna also, you know, you can you can rep your brand, you can rep your organization in a way. Your lab. That, um, yep. Yeah, exactly. Cool. So did we did you see any questions come in? I think we probably I have not. 
Okay, any other hanging questions? We're at the hour, so uh, maybe if you do, pop them into the Slack channel we have going uh, and uh, you know continue the conversation there. Otherwise, we will be back in another month's time. Are we back in August? Yep, and it's another okay. PowerPoint, a little deeper dive. Maybe yes. we'll get into some animation. Yes, definitely. Uh, a little bit. Lots to be said about that, and a lot of great features that um, that I that I'm excited to unlock for for everyone. And just deeper dive into sort of quirks and tricks in PowerPoint that will help you. Absolutely. Cool. Well, thanks for everyone for uh, for coming and listening Thank and you. uh, sharing your questions. And uh, like I said, you know, continue with the engagement on Slack if you want and uh, reach out with any questions or subjects that you want to cover in future episodes. And we'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye-bye.